We're ready to continue our program this afternoon with a time of uh, discussion and questions among the panel members, and uh, we'll be going probably a little less than an hour. And uh, around 5 o'clock, uh, the written questions that have come from the floor will be uh, delivered to me, and by some magical system, I will choose a few of those uh, to share with the panel. Uh, as we begin, let me once again introduce uh, briefly here, uh, we have uh, Fritz Guy, who is with us uh, from La Sierra University, a systematic theologian, philosophical theologian, and one of my professors at seminary, for which uh, I will always be grateful. We have uh, Larry Christoffel, who is uh, one of the pastors here at the uh, Campus Hill Church. And uh, he will bring us, I think, a bit of the perspective of practical pastoral uh, theology, looking at these things. Uh, to my right is Kendra Holoviak, who uh, I was deeply privileged to have as a student at the seminary. And uh, sometimes uh, your students go beyond you. And uh, Kendra would be one of those that I'm very proud of. And uh, she is uh, at La Sierra University and we share a specialty in the New Testament and uh, in the book of Revelation in particular. To my left, of course, is the man of the hour, and I'd like to open this discussion with just a short testimony. We have hardly ever met. I think it was just in, in passing a couple of times, so uh, this is really our closest acquaintance, and I would like to tell you that uh, growing up as a Seventh-day Adventist, uh, I was one of those weird children that spent a lot of time in the Bible and kind of knew the Bible back and forth. I was even in New York City on some Bible quizzes uh, and came out very successfully uh, over the radio and so forth as a small child. But there were two books of the Bible that always troubled me. And they weren't Daniel and Revelation, they were Romans and Galatians. And it just seemed to me if somehow those could be left out of the Bible, the Adventism I knew could be perfectly defended. <laughs> and I just want to know that uh, you were one among some that were very, very pivotal in my life to, to bring the deeper meaning of Romans and Galatians, to, to bring the way in which it uh, interacted with the larger picture that Adventists understood. And uh, so Romans and Galatians, Paul has become very meaningful to me and I'll be grateful throughout eternity uh, for your testimony and uh, the mission that you extended in these areas. And I just wanna thank you thank here you, right now to begin. My name, if anyone cares to know, <laughs> is John Pauline. And uh, as I mentioned, I. I was a student at the seminary, taught at the seminary, yes, now I'm here. dean of the School of Religion here at Loma Linda University and have been asked to moderate uh, this panel here today. What I'd like to do is address a question to the three panel members and each of you in turn can respond and then perhaps uh, Dr. Ford would like to uh, respond uh, to you. But I'd like each of you to simply uh, react to this and say what was the one aspect of what you just heard in the last hour that you would highlight? What was the most important to you? And perhaps you'd like to address it as a question to Dr. Ford or, or to elaborate on the point or maybe differ a little bit. Uh, which one of you would respond? Perhaps, uh, Fritz, would you start out? Well, it seems to me clear that like all good presentations, the thesis of our friend Des Ford was uh, evident to everybody who is awake. Uh, namely, that the metaphor of justification is not only the heart of the gospel, it is the gospel. At least I think that's what I was hearing. Uh, it's certainly uh, the heart of uh, the letter to the Romans. It ought to be the heart of Christian theology and of Christian living. Uh, that's what I took to be the the thrust of, of the presentation. Now, a question I would like to address to Des is, I hope it's all right to use your first is. name. Uh, uh, Des, you spoke of justification as a metaphor. Uh, 
metaphors always have limitations. What, in your understanding of the metaphor of justification, are its limitations? Uh, what, uh, does it need to be supplemented by other metaphors? You mentioned representation and sacrifice and, and some others. Uh, how, how are these metaphors related? Do they add to justification? Uh, or are they, uh, you almost seem to be saying that metaphor is really the big thing, that's the biggie, and these other metaphors are kind of uh, secondary. Am I misunderstanding that? Oh, right. <laughs> that's an excellent question, for which I thank you. Prince. The work of the atonement defies perfect critical analysis. The Bible is given for practical purposes and it's perfect for its purpose. So it's true that while justification in Paul alone occurs about 70 times in the Pauline's and reconciliation five and propitiation connection with the cross four and ransom three and adoption five all these others do have a part to play but the numbers speak for themselves that none of them is as adequate a metaphor as justification I agree with Fritz that all metaphors have their problems. But it's when we read all the chapters, Romans 3, Romans 4, which is about forgiveness, Romans 5, about the parallels between the two Adams and while we were yet sinners, we were reconciled. There's Catholic E. Or the death of his son. It's when we read the whole chapters that some of the problems that could be linked to too great a concentration on the metaphor fall away like the petals from a developing flower. But I think it has to always be said that everything we say about the atonement falls short, that there is no perfect metaphor. But for sinners going down for the third time, probably who will die unexpectedly and who are facing judgment day. Here's a glorious picture for which we can thank God. So, in essence, I agree with what Dr. Guy has said. All metaphors have their problems. But I do think that this one metaphor has given far more exposure, even chapters of exposure, so some of the bad edges can be rubbed off. It's, it's Sabbath afternoon and we're talking with Dr. Ford and I just have to pause and, and um, remember uh, 1980. You'll have to tell me the main points And later. in 1980, there were many, many, many Sabbath afternoons like this in my parents' living room. And it is such a privilege and an honor and a joy to once again be sharing a Sabbath afternoon with Dr. Ford. The uh, conversation partners in our living room have expanded in number quite a bit, but it is a real joy to be here. And I thank him for really a... Um, a path of exploration that he helped shape for me um, back in that year. I remember very well the first Sabbath afternoon when I had the courage to actually enter into the conversation and ask a question. And I couldn't believe it, just blurted out, and I was terrified. And Dr. Ford looked over at this 13-year-old sitting on the floor and said, that was an excellent question, Kendra. And I was just 
so thrilled that that was his first response and grateful for a journey in theology that I have him to thank uh, so much. Since that time in 1980, Dr. Ford, some of our friends, some Adventist pastors and lay people who were deeply blessed by learning the gospel, they have um, left Adventism over the Seventh-day Sabbath. That they have placed it alongside Paul's comments about circumcision and about food issues, and that they suggest that to demand a specific day of Sabbath keeping is to move from salvation by grace alone to some type of works. And I, w- I, just, would, I just wonder this afternoon what you would say to those friends of ours who have made that decision. It's akin to talking about the people who've gone too far, extremes. Yes, the, the people who have rejected the Sabbath. <laughs> See it as part of works righteousness as opposed to if I really embrace And they love scripture. They deeply love scripture and are trying to be faithful to it. But if I, if I embrace a particular day of worship, I've moved from an arena of grace to an arena of law keeping. What would you say to our friends who've made Kendra, that decision? It's my concern too. The human heart is, needs support all the time from the Holy Spirit. I do not want people to follow me any further than I follow Christ. I have the only, the only book written against Robert Brinsmead's protest over the Sabbath, I have written, The Forgotten Day. I wrote it not long after Glacier View to support the Seventh Day Sabbath. I refuse to join breakaway groups because I felt the problems such as you're mentioning would take place. I could not please the people at Evangelica at Andrews because I felt they were going too far. So my concern is exactly the same as you, that some people can take a good thing and misuse it, but that doesn't kill the truth that they are abusing. God instituted marriage and most marriages are a failure. Marriage is holy, but marriage is terribly abused. But I agree entirely with the concern that you have for people who are forsaking very clear biblical truths like the Seventh-day Sabbath and holiness of life in order to pursue their own lusts. I'm with you. You asked a question, Dr. Pauline, earlier what we thought was a single thing that stood out. And a couple of things, I think they are related. One was the idea that we are imputed or reckoned to be righteous rather than made righteous. Because what that means then is that our salvation is not um, dependent on our character development. But then you have to take it a step further and ask, well, on what basis are we reckoned righteous? And it comes down to a substitutionary death as well as a life that is ours by faith alone. And that is good news indeed. In fact, it was something I grasped um, a long time ago. You were instrumental in the 1970s prior to to Glacier View, when I was pastoring in the Ohio Conference, you had arrived at Pacific Union uh, College as an exchange teacher, and some of us wrote to you and asked for material. You sent out about a ream of material on all aspects of of righteousness by faith. If if I were to have a question for you such as, um, Kendra and Fritz had, how important in your mind is the, the human nature issue of Jesus, his, his human nature? You didn't really say much about that. Is that something that is important to you? Larry, it's very important. Christ was that holy thing. In him was no sin. 
he knew no sin. He was only in the likeness of sinful flesh. Unless he was sinless, Calvary was useless. Only a perfect offering could serve as a sacrifice. My Lord Jesus took the infirmities of the race as they were after the fall. He took all the effects of sin, but sin itself. And he remained holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. I'm glad you raised it. I should have. All right, another question to the panel members, and this time whoever would like to speak to it. And the question is, I mean, the, we didn't really get a lecture today. This was a sermon. It was a sermon from a pastor. It was a sermon from someone who cared deeply about us and about our relationship with God. It was moving and appealing. And yet this man is a controversial figure in some circles. What, why, what, what problem would somebody have with what was presented today? What, what, what is the problem? What did he say, Larry? <laughs> what problem they were having to um, to the question is, uh, with such a gracious, beautiful sermon, why would anyone have a problem with someone like Des Ford? And I want to quote him. I don't know in what venue he said this, but he said one time, people, uh, they get in trouble not for what they say, but what they don't say. So he has a lot more to say, and I think if if he were to say everything, then he might uh, raise a few eyebrows. But he certainly, I think his intent here, he came all the way from the other side of the world to bring people to Christ. And, you know, we as a panel are to critique that. However, you know, you can say amen. That would be a good critique. But I do think that once you get into the written document, that there may be some, some differences of opinion, the one that everyone has. Yesterday I was um, in Anaheim at the, for the first time, at an attendee of the uh -oh, Women of Faith Conference. And uh, it's going on today as well. And um, as I was sitting there listening to the different speakers and looking around at thousands of women present um, for this two-day conference, uh, there was a lot of language that reminded me of Dr. Ford. There was a lot of language that focused on the importance of what happened at the cross and uh, salvation by grace and grace alone. In fact, the title of the conference is Infinite Grace. And I um, was listening, and at one point I heard one of the speakers say this phrase, the wrath of God was all directed to Jesus, and he died in our place. The wrath of God was all directed to Jesus, and he died in our place. Today, as Dr. Ford was speaking, I was reminded so much of his um, picture of God that comes through his understanding of, of soteriology. That is, his, his soteriology, his understanding of atonement, shapes the way he understands his theology, that is, his view of God. And it's this amazing God. It, you were listening to some of the phrases. His gratitude at God's grace at such a savior. Um, the, the tone of the phrase, all the wrath of God was directed at Jesus, for me, feels in conflict with some of those phrases of, of a gracious God, a God who's long-suffering, a God who is wanting to wrap God's arms around each of us, no matter what we've done today or ever. And, and so I was, I was curious of what you would say to a group of people who are emphasizing a wrathful God, a God that's, that's 
needing to take out some sort of anger on someone and so turns it, thank God, to, on Jesus instead of me, but yet there's, that, that is problematic somehow in, in my heart and doesn't seem to go along with the, the view of God that you are expressing this afternoon. And I just would love to hear any, any reflections you would have on that. You've raised a very, very important topic, Kendra. <coughs> the wrath of God does not have the same meaning <coughs> as our human, irrational, unpredictable, up and down, unjust angers. The wrath of God means that because he's holy, he's so dead against sin, he will not tolerate its permanent existence in his universe. So the wrath of God in scripture <coughs> is the reaction of holiness against evil and determined to wipe it out, but it must never be construed along some of the lines that Kendra is warning us about. It's not like the wrath of the heathen gods who could be bribed and placated, but God's wrath is mentioned 580 times in the Bible under 20 different terms but always with the same idea holiness cannot permit evil to go on forever uncorrected so provided we realize the distinction between both Old and New Testament and heathenish views of wrath then there would be no problem but we dare not leave it out, 585 references to God's antagonism to evil. So I hear you saying that it's perhaps an extension of what Des is teaching, a, a misunderstanding of it that perhaps it's some people misunderstand. are grabbing onto uh, that, is, that is causing some of this. I, I'm reminded of the time I got a traffic ticket uh, about 124 years ago uh, and uh, I looked at the ticket and it said the state of New Jersey against John Pauline. I mean that was awful. I mean I read that it says the whole state is mad at me. <laughs> but that's not what it's saying. It is the state of New Jersey in a, in a larger sense that in some way I had offended that I needed to make it right. It wasn't that everyone was angry at me. It wasn't this irrational uh, fury that you're talking about. Very, very helpful distinction. Let me be a little more pro provocative, though. Um, the cross, as you teach it, doesn't it have a moral influence? Yes. The problem with the moral influence theory is not what it affirms. It's what it denies. Of course the cross has a moral influence. Of course the cross reveals the love of God. But when you say, he saved me by revealing his love, that's a half-truth. Because the cross revealed God's justice, God's hatred of evil, God's integrity, God's fulfillment of the warning in Eden. If you eat thereof, you'll surely die. So the moral inference is correct in what it affirms. But in leaving out the sacrificial aspect of the cross, it flies in the face of so much scripture. Ephesians 5.2, he offered himself as a sacrifice for us. Most heresies are right in what they affirm and wrong in what they deny. Uh, Des, uh, uh, during your presentation, you said that, at least I understood you to say, that when God declares us righteous, God is declaring us not guilty. Now, let me uh, play a little bit of devil's advocate here. The fact is, I am guilty. And I'm guilty whether God says I'm guilty or not. I mean, even God can't make my guilt <coughs> happen. Right? I mean, you know, what I've done, I have done. Now, what does it mean, what do you mean when you say that 
God declares us not guilty. I mean that the penalty of my guilt has been paid. The debt has been met. I'm no longer in debt. Therefore, the Bible says I am acquitted. And it is not Des Ford, of course. It is Paul that says I am acquitted. Right, right. But then that too needs to be understood somewhat metaphorically. Yes, you can't avoid the metaphor. Just, just as the, the, the term wrath or the, the idea of God's anger. And this is, this is characteristic of all our talk about God. Yes. We, we, the only language we have is the language that we get from everyday life. I agree. And, and so yeah. when we talk about God, when we use these same words to talk about God, we can never mean them absolutely literally because God isn't us. But God's let's not emasculate them. True. Let's not castrate them. Let's that's, not empty them of, of their basic meaning. Right, but that's why I think it is helpful if we can, as far as possible, and, and you were right, we can never you know, really sort this out to the very end, but as far as possible, say, just as you did with, with the notion of wrath a few minutes ago, uh, sort out what it means from what it doesn't mean. Yes. Yes. When, when we talk about, when I get angry, I'm, uh, I'm uns- upset. I've lost it. Yes. Well, God doesn't lose it. No. You know, so Fritz, when, yeah. when we talk about Fritz's anger and God's anger, uh, they are different. Very different. And I almost always make that point, as I did in talking to Kendra. When you talk to me and you say, Des, do you catch what I'm saying? Well, you didn't throw anything. It's not possible to speak without metaphor. But the fact that we can understand one another for practical purposes, meaning that metaphors recognised to be such, can be helpful and not necessarily harmful. Oh, that's all we've got. That's all we've got. And, so, and, and I think that's one reason why we have a number of them. Yes. To, to try to help us not misuse, yes. misunderstand. I agree. And, and they sort of uh, limit each other, if that's not too strong a word, or balance each other, supplement yes. each other, so that the whole panoply of metaphors I agree. is useful. I agree. Uh, Des, I felt you kind of half answered Kendra's question earlier. Uh, she, it was a twofold question asking about wrath, but then how the wrath related to Jesus. Right. How would you explain in Romans 5, for example, when it says we shall be saved from God's wrath through him or that we have been justified by his blood? Is there a connection between these things? <laughs> Permit me to go to the classic passage first, if I may. In chapter 3. <clears throat> God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement. When F.F. Bruce comments on this passage, he tells us there's no reason to avoid the term propitiation, which means a recognition of the fact of an antagonism to evil. Not the heathen bribing, not that. A propitiation as used in four passages. First John two two, first John four, this passage and at least one other. Hebrews two seventeen, I think. They are all saying that at the cross God's antagonism to evil was experienced by the Son of God, and the cross was propitiatory. And many of the best scholars in centuries are prepared to endorse that position. But, remembering the warnings that Fritz has kindly given us, you must never stretch that word propitiation into a pagan bribe, for that it is not. There is a wrath to come. Larry mentioned Romans 5. In the second... First Thessalonians, the beginning and the end of the book, it says, God doesn't intend us for wrath, but there is wrath coming, 
For the impenitent, for those who reject love, there's no sin like the rejection of love. And there is wrath coming for the impenitent. And the Bible's crystal clear about that. First Thessalonians, the first chapter, First Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, Romans 5, the fifth chapter, etc., etc., etc. Don't drop out the wrath of God. It's our protection. You want a clean universe? I want a God that's angry against evil. I want a God that's so holy, he's determined to get rid of anything that vitiates goodness. I think it's been a very helpful <coughs> discussion because I think often uh, when debates occur, it's a caricature against a caricature. Yeah. And, and what I hear you saying to my question is it's not either or. There is moral influence at the cross, but there's moral influence that is enhanced uh, by the importance of the cross. The more important the cross becomes, the greater its influence. So the two uh, can work together in a positive way. Good. Now, um, I, I heard you say, and you, you've given us some statistics that uh, this legal law court metaphor is the chief metaphor in the New Testament. And I, I think I've counted 17 now. There's, there's banking metaphors, you know, debt and forgiveness. Uh, there's sanctuary temple metaphors. There's relationship metaphors. So there's a lot of metaphors for salvation in the New Testament, about 17 at last count. Um, is it legitimate, this is for the whole, the whole panel, is it legitimate to determine which is chief by counting number of inferences? Is that, re is that really, to say it's the chief on that ground, does that really make it chief? Surely it would seem strange if one of them is given chapters of expansion, like Romans 3, 4 and 5, to ignore God's emphasis. I agree with you, we want all the others, as Fritz has said, Kendra would say. But where God shouts, I must shout. Where God speaks softly, I speak softly. He's a safe model. I know Albert. <laughs> Albert Schweitzer and a number who followed him saw the in Christ motif as very important and it seemed to be used quite a bit. Um, and sometimes theologians will say, well, that, that is even more important than the justification motif, 164 times. So what would you say to that type of argument that, uh, for example, N.T. Wright, um, would say that the gospel is not justification by faith. The gospel is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, but justification by faith is more deciding who's a member of the community. In other words, is it possible that Jesus himself is the gospel, but that, that justification by faith takes a lesser place? Christ himself. <coughs> is the gospel. Hanging on the cross, he was the gospel. <coughs> <coughs> but <clears throat> I want all he's told me <clears throat> about the meaning of the good news, the good, glad and merry tidings that make us the heart to sing and the feet to dance. I want everything he's said. I don't want to reduce it. Now as regards N.T. Wright, <coughs> He's a humble Christian, an evangelical. He's written at length on penal substitution, commentary on Isaiah 52, 53. But if we take him seriously, he's the only man in 2,000 years that understands the New Testament. He gives new definitions for justification and the righteousness of God, not supported by any lexicon and not supported in the context. I cannot accept N.T. Wright as the only man in 2,000 years who understands the New Testament. Now coming back to where you started on in Christ, it's tremendously important, as John has pointed out, over 160 references, but there are also runs, there are associate comments or there are implicit comments 
They're not explicit themes that's expanded as such. This is what it means to be in Christ. No, no. I would give to an interrogator on it, my Bible, and say, take me through Romans on in Christ. He'd have great difficulty. Great difficulty. So, very, very important, but I must give it the same type of importance that it seems to me the New Testament gives it, where it's made subsidiary, runs alongside, elaborates things that are given a greater emphasis. When I got to graduate school, I learned that, much to my shock, that um, some of my classmates did not like Paul, and that's putting it nicely. <laughs> and when I pushed them as to why, because for me it was the place you went to have the gospel explained, when I asked them those kinds of questions, they responded with, Paul hates women. <laughs> so I'm going to hate Paul. <clears throat> what would you have shared with those, those I classmates would quote of Paul. mine? that in Christ there's neither male nor female. People who take that stand are just followers of Bishop Spong and not to be regarded as trustworthy. What would you say, would, would you be able to challenge them at the very heart of Paul's theology that that is a misunderstanding of Paul's letters? Look, in Romans 16, he calls one woman an apostle, Junius. So if Paul could give a woman apostleship, who am I to try and denigrate him as a misogynist? It would have been great if you were in that first class with me. <laughs> well, let me, uh, let me direct another potential misunderstanding and, and, and see if you can clear that up for us. Uh, one might get the impression from the paper that you handed out and from some of the things you said that the words like righteous and righteousness are always a law court verdict in scripture. Is that what you believe? No, it's not what I believe. <clears throat> Context is always our guide to any statement of scripture. Scripture says there is no God. It says that more than one place. Context helps me. Yeah. Because in many places to be righteous is simply to do the right yes, thing. Yes, it does. Correct. Yeah. And Correct. the whole point is that the right doing of Jesus becomes ours There is a faith. moral meaning. It's yeah. not always forensic. It's, it's not a, a vapor. There's, there's a substantive no, I agree right doing. Yes. Okay, so this is, there are many caricatures in these theological debates, and, and that's why a discussion like this is extremely important. The point is, in a sermon, no one can say everything. And time comes when a man has to open his mouth, <laughs> he's an idiot if he tries to say everything. Can't be done. Uh, Des, uh, you've talked a lot about <clears throat> Romans and Galatians and what I would call, I think accurately, your understanding of the gospel according to Paul. How is this related to the other gospels? There are, after all, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, it would seem from your presentation today, which is not everything that Des Ford thinks, believes, etc., but that really uh, you are in love with Paul and, and the four Gospels are kind of secondary, or they provide the grist for Paul's theology or something. Can you, can you help us understand <laughs> your understanding of the relation of Paul uh, to the uh, four pictures of Jesus that yeah. we have and that are the only sources we really have uh, about Jesus? There's a very <coughs> famous book called The Progress of Doctrine in the New Testament by Thomas Dahani Bernard. <coughs> wonderful, wonderful book. <coughs> And he points out to us that the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, do tell the story of the cross, but do not set out to interpret it in any great detail. 
Therefore, many have said Christ made the atonement, but Paul explained it. So what we have in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are small, gnomic, pithic, almost proverbial sentences, such as, this is my blood of the new covenant, shed for many for the redemption and permission of sins. We have many of these <coughs> that are not expanded until we get after Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came to lead us into all truth. Remember Jesus said in John's Gospel, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. I have many things to say unto you now, but you can't bear them now. So the four Gospels do not claim to be complete. They are anticipatory, and they do often include in small tiny pithy statements something that will later be expanded after the spirit was poured out at Pentecost. Would it be fair then to say that theologically you regard Romans, well the, the Pauline materials as uh, sort of uh, superior to or prior, well they're not prior to chronic, well even I guess they are prior to chronologically in terms of the actual composition of the gospels but uh, Say a little more about that if, if you would. Romans is the only systematic book of theology among the epistles. Most of Paul's other letters are written to meet local problems. He's never been to Rome. He's about to go. He wants them to know the essence of his theology. It's not all there but the essence of it is there. So here's the one systematic book and because my mind is not as good as I'd like it to be, where God has been systematic, I say thank you Lord <clears throat> and I try and read what God has set out so carefully. For example in Romans 1 to 5 we're free from the wrath of God. In Romans 6 we are free from the dominion of sin. In Romans 7, we are free from law as a covenant. In Romans 8, the believer is free from death. Now, I believe that what Paul has given us in Romans was verbally expressed to those churches where the letters do not have the word justification frequently present. But what you'll find is when 1 Corinthians 6.11 says you are justified, <coughs> it never tries to explain it. When on rare occasions, in the non-primary epistles of Romans and Galatians, on the rare occasions where justification comes in, 1 Corinthians 1.30, 6.11, Philippians 3, no attempt to explain it because they'd heard it all. So it is true. <coughs> I regard Romans <coughs> as the primary book explaining the meaning of Calvary and the way of salvation. But thank God it's not the only book. I love preaching and teaching Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. I love the book of Hebrews. We want them all. But again, to me, where God shouts, I must listen. Where he whispers, I'll still want to know what he says, but it not, might, may not have quite as much importance. Just, just a really quick follow-up. Given that um, the Gospels are written after Paul, yeah. what would you say to someone who would suggest that one or more of the Gospels could actually be a commentary on Paul's ministry, or it could be uh, another perspective on uh, the, the Christian church and the way it's growing. Um, I'm thinking of the Gospel of Matthew and if Paul's ministry has already taken off uh, several dec for several decades um, among the Gentiles and then, and, and Matthew is aware of that, one could, could imagine his Gospel as uh, sort of a comment, if you will, on 
Paul's ministry. What would, what would be some of your reflections on that, given that the Gospels are written after the letters of Paul? Matthew's Gospel has more references to the Old Testament than all the other Gospels put together. It was obviously in the providence of God it became the linking book for the two testaments. It does not set out to give a complete picture of Jesus. He's presented mainly as the king of the Jews, that it might be fulfilled that was written in the prophets, which is not an expression you find as a rule in the other gospels. See, <clears throat> Mark, he presents Christ not now as the king, but as the servant. And Luke says, He's our universal brother. And John says, well, that's all right for the human breadth, king, servant, brother, but let me give you the divine depth. So John has more on the deity of Christ. <clears throat> so these are four books about Jesus that do give us a detailed description of his death but not an interpretation of it. For that we must wait till after the Pentecostal showers led the apostles, the Gentiles, to give himself to that. Christ made the atonement, Paul explained it. Matthew doesn't explain it. Mark doesn't explain it. Luke doesn't explain it. They all have little gnomic statements, but no expanded statement. Can I do follow up? Just really quickly, you know, most people believe that John may have written after, after Paul and um, as some of the others, but can you explain why, other than in the book of Revelation, John doesn't use the word gospel, and I think he's quite sparing in terms like righteousness, and, and yet John is the theologian of the New Testament. That is to say, the, the final... He had the final word. John is writing to the church universal. <clears throat> He's not primarily writing to Jews like Matthew, or to Romans like Mark, or the Greeks like Luke. He's living at a time <clears throat> when many of the heresies have come up and been answered. <clears throat> but it's perfectly plain that the preeminence given to Calvary by later men like Paul is a reflection of John's own importance, re-Calvary. When you get to chapter 12, to the end of the Gospel, it's all on Passion Week. But Paul, uh, John is the apostle of the whole church, east, west, north, south, doesn't limit himself to legal metaphors, justification. Rather, he's trying to look at the heights and depths after over 50 years' reflection on the cross. These are a few of the things I'd want to say. The time has come to collect questions uh, from the audience. I hope you've been preparing them. And we'll handle one more of our own up here while uh, those are being collected and uh, have them brought up here to us. And the question I'd like to throw out as we uh, wait for that, uh, one of the things I've noticed in what you said and in what you passed out to us and so on, there's a strong identification with the Reformation, with Luther and, and with Calvin and, and, and so forth. And the question I'd throw out to the panel first and then to Des would be the question is, you know, these categories that Stendhal and N.T. Wright and E.P. Sanders and many others are saying, you know, the Reformation in many ways misunderstood Paul. <clears throat> and I guess the question I would throw out to the panel is how helpful is it today to, to bring up the categories of the Reformation and to, to reaffirm them? Or is that missing the mark with today's generation? What do you think? May I comment <coughs> on your reference to the NPP, <laughs> a new perspective on Paul. This is a view mainly known in English-speaking countries. It's a view that's rejected by many of the top scholars in those English-speaking countries, 
when Fitzmaier wrote his magisterial commentary on Romans for the Anchor series, he pretty well threw out NPP from start to finish. Other scholars have done the same. <clears throat> In the last uh, 10 years or so, a great number of scholars have found fault with Stendhal, Sanders, Wright and Dunn. Not denying the elements of truth to be found in each one. <coughs> Stendhal was right. Paul had a robust conscience. Sanders was right. Early Judaism did believe in grace, though they practiced legalism. And so in recent 10 years, many books have come out and said Sanders has used sophisticated proof texting. He did not give a <coughs> wide enough survey of his sources and he's often homileticized where they disagree with him. Two recent books edited by Don Carson, Justification and Covenantal Nomism. Recent book by Stuhlmarker and there's a whole tissue of books now coming out <coughs> finding fault with the NPP and yet not denying that there were some elements of truth in each of those men. Now, when you talk about the Reformation, we dare not despise what God has done in history. We dare not deny the work of the Holy Spirit in impressing millions of people with the gospel through the reformers. We just cannot wipe it out. That's our history. That's what God has done. It'll be important till the end of time. While we're still collecting a few more, um, just to kind of follow up. How long do you want to stay? You, <laughs> you mentioned James Dunn, both in your presentation and just now. Um, I've been very challenged by one of his works that suggests that to read Paul through the lens of Martin Luther is to misread him about his main question, which instead of being how a person is saved, um, the question of who is saved. And that the dilemma for Paul was wrestling with this idea that, really the idea of election, that it's not just the Jews. And, and Gentiles, yes, if they're willing to become a Jew, then they can be saved. But to actually believe that through Jesus, every person has the opportunity to be part of the family of God, to be called children of God. This is the way Dunn, if I'm understanding him correctly, thinks that, that the real question should be posed, not how we're saved, but who is saved. What would be your response to I would say that James Martin Luther agreed with Dunn. It wasn't just how, but who. Uh, people who read Luther certainly get the impression that God so loved the world, not just the Germans. <coughs> have to be careful with Dunn <coughs> and Luther. He never goes to original sources. He is often, misrep well, several times misrepresented Luther. He took the position that Luther held that Romans 7, 14 to 25 was the unconverted man not the mature Christian. He was wrong. Luther wrote in detail 14 reasons why this was. Historians have faulted Dunn and Wright for not going to original Lutheran sources but using secondary and often shoddy sources. So the burden that Dunn has is what Luther had, salvation for the world. Remember Dunn said Sanders began with a bang and went out with a whimper. And the reason he said that was because he couldn't agree with Sanders' view of Paul. I think Martin Luther is well worthy of our continued attention. God didn't use an idiot to bring about the Reformation. Well, I just wanted to, to make a quick comment on this. Uh, we all read scripture through our own experience. Martin Luther certainly did. 
for those who have a Luther-like experience, and I would guess this would include numberless Adventists, that is, who have, have been oppressed by uh, a perceived legalism uh, in their religion, uh, that for them, the Luther version of Paul, if I can put it that way, is liberating, it is redemptive, uh, and I would suggest that Dunn says some very positive things about Luther's interpretation of Paul and how valuable that is. And you quoted Dunn on uh, justification uh, early on. And, and so I think we just need to be aware that all of us, well, as someone has said, theology is always partly autobiographical. Yes. And so we should be very... Uh, I think aware of that for the theologies, plural, that we read, and especially for the theology that we expound, that is our own theology, that yes, this has been shaped by my own experience, uh, my education, uh, you know, my life as a husband, father, grandfather, all of that, uh, this goes into uh, my understanding of God and humanity and what everything is about. So I think it's, a, it's helpful uh, for us to realize that Luther did that too uh, and perhaps then not take Luther as the absolute word, the final word, uh, but we need to go back to Paul and read Paul as objectively as we can, knowing that the as we can always recognizes that we read through our own eyes, our own glasses, and that makes a difference. Oh, I buy all of that. <clears throat> May I address that also? I wanted to say that I found um, Dunn and Saunders and N.T. Wright and Christopher Stendhal to be, you know, just very stimulating and a lot of good things that are in them. What I don't like, though, sometimes is when we pit off the question of a social issue, that is, whether Gentiles belong as, as opposed to the Jewish Christians, and make that the only deal, because I think that the individual's salvation is intimately tied to that. Um, the problem with the new perspective on Paul, especially with N.T. Wright, is that if you follow through on it, you're going to see the law as the boundary markers, including the Seventh-day Sabbath. So, you know, his book, uh, What the Apostle Paul Really Said, identifies the Sabbath as, as one of the marks of legalism. So while there's a lot of good insights, I, I think there are some dangers too. Right. What would you comment? What would be your comment? Oh, I agree one hundred percent. That comment. Thank you. Well, I want to really um, compliment this audience. This is an unbelievable collection of questions. Fantastic. In fact, I think I'm going to give them all to Des at the end, and I hope a book is coming. The answers to questions because uh, there's enough substance here for a book. We're not going to cover it this afternoon. But uh, let's just throw a few here and, uh, and see where we want to go with it. What is the role of obedience in relation to justification? It's not possible <coughs> to fall in love with Christ and not follow him in wholehearted obedience. All right. Now, in Loma Linda, you're going to get a certain type of question you don't get most places because about 100 meters from here, people are dying. And it's almost impossible to do theology here without a, a deep sense of engagement with the real world and so on. I, I sense some of that in a couple of these questions. Let me share one of these. What is the relevance and significance of human pain and suffering with Christ's sacrifice on the cross. What would you say to a dying person over there in the medical center? Our Lord's sufferings have been the closest 
to a spiritual anodyne for sufferers available anywhere. <clears throat> it's the story of our Lord's pain, that people in pain find to some degree healing. There is nothing better. Here's an interesting one. Uh, what does Paul say that the Gospels do not say, or to put it another way, if somehow the letters of Paul had never come to us, what could we know of the Gospel? Could we understand the Gospel from the Gospels alone, and what would that be? <clears throat> yes, we would learn enough for salvation. We would not learn enough for complete Christian edification. I'm going to read this one. It's a bit lengthy, but I think it's one that, that many folk here would want you to address. Isn't the beauty of the Christian faith a loving God who does not demand an execution in death? Rather, Christ's death was a voluntary demonstration to us in the whole look universe that there's no end to what our Lord, our God, would go to commit his life to show us this love. An unjust death for no cause, Jesus' death is much more than just a legal act. It's sort of a challenge. What do you want to say? It sounds beautiful, but it's quite untestamental. There's no support for any of that in the New Testament. Could you elaborate? <laughs> The New Testament says at least a dozen times Christ's death was a sacrifice. That statement's trying to get rid of it. I prefer the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any of the panel members want well, to speak to that? Well, I would like to press Des a, a little bit. What do you mean when you say Christ's death was a sacrifice? Sacrifice, uh, at least in Old Testament times, was a way of propitiating the gods. Uh, what, what do you mean when you say Christ's death was a sacrifice? A sacrifice to whom and for what reason? The Bible says he offered himself to God as a sacrifice. Hebrews 9 and 10, Ephesians 5. There is no dodging that's the, big, that's the, big the many references that our Lord's death had to do with atonement for human sin. There's just no way out of it. It's written in so many places. And when he said at the Lord's Supper, this is my blood of the new covenant, shed for many for the remission of sins, you can't get any other meaning out of it than a sacrificial, expiatory, atoning death. Now, okay, but keep, keep going. Why did God need that? Because God, can't is God isn't God sovereign? Can't God just forgive sin? No, no he can't, because God is holy. The Bible is very clear in Romans 3 that he might be just and the justifier. Don't miss out the first bit. The cross was in order that God might appear to be just. He was upholding his sacred law. He wasn't minimizing sin. Okay, but even, even that suggests that there is a, uh, a value or even the value of the cross is to uphold, it's kind of governmental theory of atonement, it sounds like you're saying, to, to uphold the moral order. My question uh, that I'm wanting to press you on, uh, perhaps mischievously, is uh, did God as God need the death of his son. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And just before that, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man <clears throat> be lifted up. And in crisis after crisis, our Lord alludes to his atoning death. The Greeks come. He says, Father, save me from this hour. It's never like Paul who wants to depart. Save me from this hour. He says to Nicodemus, he must be lifted up. 
he says to the apostle, the Son of Man must, must, must. Yes, it was a definite must in the mind of God that there should be an atoning death that held to view the sacredness of the law of God, which is God's nature. The law of God, not something outside of God, dictating to God. The law of God is what God is. So forgiveness had to be a just forgiveness. Spurgeon said, I wouldn't have felt forgiven <coughs> unless I knew my Lord had suffered for my sins. And that's the experience of most evangelical Christians. They would not feel forgiven unless they knew that their sin had been atoned for. Thank you. Another Loma Linda question. Good. <laughs> I'm a physical scientist and need to understand mechanisms. How do I get from sinful now to sinless in heaven? Does God rewire my head? And if that is the solution, why didn't he do it years ago? <laughs> <coughs> the dear God is a lot more patient than you and me. And he has purposes that embrace eternity and the whole universe. When I'm in trouble, <coughs> I want it fixed, pronto, <coughs> regardless. God's not stupid like that. God takes eternity into account, takes the whole universe into account. What was the first part there, John? Um, physical science needs to know, oh, how yeah. do I get from yeah, sinful to sinless? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Bible speaks about justification, sanctification, glorification. We often neglect the third, 1 Corinthians 15, is very clear that this mortal must put on immortality. This sinful organism will have every trace of sin removed in the renovation of the human believer by either translation or the resurrection. Glorification is the answer to the question. It may not be an explanation to our scientists, but it is the biblical answer. So the Bible gives us direction, the scientists need to tell us how, okay? Uh, I think one of your members here is being provocative, uh, says, uh, what are the other issues that Larry mentioned uh, that he has a problem with? Do we have another hour? <laughs> I'm, I'm they can in, ask questions on that tonight. Yeah, yeah I am in basic agreement with Des, but like probably most people who wrestle with these things, you do see little inconsistencies here and there. Can I throw you just one, for example? Throw him one. All right. <laughs> you, you say that justification and righteousness are the same word in Greek. Why then do you refer to the righteousness of sanctification? Because of the reason that John gave <coughs> recently, that the word righteous isn't always used in a legal meaning. It often has to do with morality. Would That's you why. say that the verb, the verb always does relate to reckoning and things like that, whereas the yes. noun might have behavioral Correct. as well as, yes. as the meaning of the verb? Correct. In the Hebrew as well as the Greek. Okay, here's a question with a provocative, I mean a, a testimony with a provocative question at the end. Thank you for preaching the gospel. It's the first time I've heard it in a Seventh-day Adventist church in years. <laughs> Has the Seventh-day Adventist church ever apologized for defrocking you? <clears throat> the Roman Catholic Church has made over a hundred apologies. Adventism makes none. <laughs> but, uh, but, excuse me, John, I, I think we should point out that it took the papacy more than 300 years True. To, to acknowledge that Galileo was right. True. So, be patient. <laughs> but it took one papal leader to come out again and again and again, John Paul II, and say, we sinned. We sinned. I've never heard that from the General Conference. 
you can do that. Are you a universalist? No. Why not? Because it's anti-biblical. Elaborate. The Bible has many passages, such as in Revelation 20, that those who reject the message of love have made heaven impossible for them. So God in mercy gives them their wish. Nothingness. Was everyone justified yes. at the cross? To quote Ellen White, Christ took the whole human race in his arms and restored it to favour with God. Yes. Then why aren't Romans you a universalist? <laughs> by the sin of one, condemnation came upon all men. And by the righteousness of one, justification came upon all men. As many have been justified as were ruined by the fall. Yes, whole world's been justified. Then why won't they all be saved? Because they won't accept it. You know, you may want to give your children an education. In fact, you want to give them a gift. It doesn't guarantee they get educated. Are you saved by accepting it or lost for rejecting it? I'm, think, I'm, again, I'm thinking of people who've never heard of Christ. Are you saved by accepting it or are you lost for rejecting it? You are lost for rejecting it. I believe the Spirit of God is at work everywhere among Mohammedans, Hindus, Buddhists, appealing to that spark of the image of God that's in every soul. The Bible has many indications that there will be people saved outside the scope of special revelation, but only because of the cross, whether they've heard of it or not. This will need to be our last question. What about the heavenly sanctuary? You must be joking. Very, very short one. <laughs> Does it exist or is it only a metaphor? Is Jesus there now? How are we to understand uh, what the Bible says about Jesus' work there? Hebrews 9 says the sanctuary is heaven itself. It says it. Read Hebrews 9. When I was a boy of 15, I read it. I said, that's not great controversy. When I was a boy of 15, and I read Hebrews 9, these are the things that are there. The two apartments represent the two dispensations, the Jewish and the Christian. The cleansing of the sanctuary was the Day of Atonement at the cross. And that at our Lord's death, he fulfilled, but did not consummate, that Levitical type. So you cannot read Hebrews 9 without seeing how the New Testament writers understood heaven itself, which has been purified from the shadow of sin by the cross of Christ, by his atonement on Calvary. I would like to thank all the participants today, Fritz Guy, La Sierra University, Larry Christoffel, Campus Hill Church here at Loma Linda, Des Ford, esteemed uh, retired professor, uh, still on the beach, I think in Australia, <laughs> Kendra Holoviak from La Sierra, I'm John Pauline from Loma Linda University, and we have a multitude of marvelous panelists who have assisted in our work today. It's been one of the most inspiring and stimulating uh, discussions I've ever been involved with, and I want to thank all of you. Can we just bow our heads where we sit and invite God to bring a conclusion to this? Lord, I'm grateful to you. You have humbled us again this afternoon as, as we all realize that, as Isaac Newton said, even with the vastness of Scripture before us, we're like playing with pebbles on the seashore. There's an ocean that lies ahead of things we only dimly understand. And today we have covered a number of issues, but above all else, Lord, we have been once again charmed with you, charmed with the incredible work of salvation,
There are many metaphors, many people have responded in different ways, yet we thank you that we were reminded once again it's not about us, it's all about you and what you have done. And I thank you for this. I thank you for the privilege we have of serving you every day. I thank you for everyone that has come and invite your presence in their lives to bless, to strengthen, and to give deeper insight each day. So scatter us now with your blessing in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Kendra. Thank you for being so gentle. So where do we go now? We've got this tea on somewhere, haven't we? Yes. Oh, here's the man. I'll follow you.